I wanted to show now a different um, use case and then kind of dig into the template and explain what's happening. So I wanted to show off this virtual machine use case because it's a little bit different than the dev container one. Um, and then go into how that is actually defined in the template. And we'll make a small change to the template and show how that works for developers. So um, I have AWS open on the right side and Coder open on the left. And I wanted to show what kind of happens in AWS land um, when a developer creates an AWS, or I guess a VM workspace in Coder land. Um, keep in mind, you don't need to use AWS to use Coder. Coder actually works on any cloud and even on on-prem data centers for spinning up um, virtual machines. And that's all because of templates. So I'll explain a little bit more about how this works, but first I just wanted to show um, the, the magic. So let me go ahead and create a workspace. I'll just name this VM time. And um, the developer is also given several prompts here. Um, they get to choose the operating system, um, their, their instance type, as well as what region they want to deploy into. So I'm going to go ahead and do Ubuntu. I want maybe a, a beefier workspace. And um, I want to deploy out into Ohio. Now, um, for a developer, these concepts are pretty easy to understand. They know what an operating system is, they know what CPU and RAM is, and they know what um, kind of a region they want is. The, the reason it's asking for the region, and maybe this is something I should have explained in this description, is it's important that the developer picks a workspace in a region that's very physically close to where they are. Um, so I'm, I'm close to Ohio, and that'll give me the fastest latency when I'm typing or running commands in my workspace or when I'm transferring files into it. Um, and I wanted to compare that to this AWS launch instances um, button. So in, in this case, when a developer is making a workspace encoder, they don't need access to AWS at all. They don't need an AWS account. This can be running on a like service account on AWS. Um, and they don't need to see all these things. So to kind of compare to this AWS launch page, AWS has a lot more options, but a lot of these aren't necessarily intuitive to the, the average developer, or um, maybe some of these things you don't want them to change. So what Coder does is it lets the admin kind of pick what parameters in AWS um, they kind of want to show and even give a friendly name for them. So if you're kind of looking at different instance types here, it's a little bit kind of confusing to see kind of what's going on here. I mean, it, it has everything, but how do you know you want a T3 versus an E3 or whatever? The admin can kind of pick out what parameters they want the developer to see and choose. And the other things like key pair or security groups, those are actually hard coded into the template. So when the user creates a workspace, um, it'll kind of be done for them. So let's go back to this instances page. Um, suddenly I have three instances in here and it was empty, um, but these, these are all terminated. So we'll kind of ignore those. And um, let me go ahead and create my, my workspace now. Um, what's happening is Coder actually gives the logs of what's um, kind of running to provision this. And if you're familiar with Terraform, these are a Terraform logs. Now, the Terraform is not running on my local machine. This is running on the Coder server. So the developer doesn't need to know what Terraform is. They don't need access to the cloud or anything, um, as long as the Coder server is authenticated. Um, so now that it's like spinning up this workspace, it's creating this AWS instance. Let me go ahead and refresh this page over here. And we can see my, my virtual machine is spun up. It's automatically given a name. Um, it's automatically given an instance type. And all of the other settings, like the VPC it runs in, the security group, the developer didn't need to think about that. It's kind of automatically happening um, or automatically being set based on what's in the template. And again, I'll, I'll, get into what, um, I'll get into what our template looks like in a second. And I think a lot of this will make more sense. So again, the end user kind of gets this magical experience. They're able to create a workspace, connect to it, and never even need to interact with this AWS dashboard that's on the right. I'm just kind of showing what's what's happening. In fact, um, I'm actually going to go ahead and just close this out. I don't think we need it for the rest of the demo. Um, Coder is also writing a little script on the workspace. So the the way that um, the the works this AWS VM connects to Coder is a lightweight agent runs on the VM which then has the, a small token, which then authenticates the coder. Well, actually, in AWS's case, it doesn't even use a token. It just uses instance identity. So it's, it's very secure. So a little agent's running on this VM somewhere, and it's able to connect back into to coder. Um, and we, we have docs on the, the networking requirements and um, everything there, so I won't get into it. You don't need to have any ports um, open, though, on the virtual machine at all. You don't need port 22 open. You don't need port 443 open, nothing. Um, so you can have a very secure virtual machine uh, running. It basically just needs to be able to curl this URL um, and then it's able to establish a connection. 
Um, so my workspace is up here. The developer is giving some very basic stats on um, their workspace, which is cool. Their CPU, their memory, their disk. And similar to my um, demo of the, the dev containers, I can open a terminal. I'm um, inside the VM. Um, so like you name the Linux VM, very cool. If I do, um, I'm in Ubuntu 20.04, like I was expecting. And I can click in to use VS Code desktop. Um, something that's a little bit different than um, the dev container example is that this is a fully persistent VM, meaning, um, let me close out of this guy. When um, I stop this workspace, it'll just stop the VM in AWS. And when it started, it'll just start it up. So everything in my root volume is persisted. We have another example where only the home directory is persisted. Um, but this essentially lets a developer set up a VM like they would a new computer. So unlike kind of setting things up in a dev container, if I want to install a new file, I can just do um, sudo apt get update. I can do, um, and then just install other packages with apt. I guess I can show it. Um, well, I have nano, I'll do cow say. Which is a very um, important app for development. So I can do now cow say, hello. Let's use do, uh, such user games. Wow, I'm committed to the demo at this point. So there we go, I got my new tool. And when I restart my workspace, I'll still have access to all of that. So um, things can be automated such as this IDE was automatically installed through the script. Things can also be automatically installed in the image that's being used for the image, or for the for the workspace, excuse me, um, the VM image. So you can provide developers with specific AMIs um, or the equivalent for your cloud. Um, and you can also make workspaces entirely ephemeral. So it all start up on the latest um, image that has the security updates, whatever. Um, there's, there's, there's options. Um, now let's go into the template and explain kind of how this was all possible. So I'll close out of this again. And um, I want to actually show the template here. And I want to show the file side by side. I'm not sure if I click this, if it'll open in a new tab. It won't. So what I'll do is I'll make a new tab. Put this here, and we'll go back to the template here. Great. So um, the the template on the the left here, just on the template page, shows shows a little like visualization of what's going to be created. So it's going to create this AWS instance. Um, it's called Dev, and um, the specific region, instance type, and disk. Those are kind of three options about it. And it's also provisioning the agent that I was talking about here, which will run on the AWS instance. Um, I can show a little bit more of a complicated example. Let's see the, let's see the Kubernetes one. Uh, this is a slightly more diff, uh, complicated example where it's provisioning a Kubernetes pod with an agent. It's also provisioning a disk, a namespace, and some other hidden stuff down here that's not super important to the, the admin. And what's kind of cool is as the admin, you can customize and put different icons for these resources So um, and different names. So if a um, developer isn't like super kind of sure what the persistent volume claim is, you can add a little icon or you can even rename this just to call it disk for example. But going back into our AWS one, um, let's look at the code for this template. And again, this is just Terraform. And um, this is editable, so I'm in the editor. I can edit it in the UI, or I can use um, uh, what we see kind of our enterprise customers do is they'll manage this and get have it run in a pipeline, um, go, have it go through proper reviews. So all these templates can be managed and stored in Git as well. Um, now, the, the first thing outside of just us importing the parameters or importing the providers is this code of parameter here. And it's called operating system choice. And this looks very familiar to the prompts that the developer sees when they first create a workspace to ask them what operating system they want to use. And this is because in the template, you can kind of build the form that a developer gets to pick. So you can pick whether like they want to choose the operating system, the instance type and the region. And here they are, each with different icons too. So you can specify different icons. You have a lot of customizability on what the experience here looks like. And then you can reference those later on in the, the template. So um, here I am with, with AWS. This is where I first start referencing the, the parameter. 
is it's asking for what region AWS wants to provision against. And it's actually referencing the parameter value here of what region the developer picked. So in this case, it's not hard coded, but if I wanted to make sure that every developer was on um, US East, maybe that was like super important, I could just do US East one. And even if like the developer picked something here, it wouldn't, um, it wouldn't make a difference. And then I could actually just remove that parameter too. Um, here I am finding the AMI for each the machine image for each image or for each operating system. And again, you could provide your own AMI. So I'm just using the official ones that AWS provides, but if you had a um, base AMI or base image that you wanted all your workspaces to use, you could just reference those here. Um, here we are creating the coder agent. The, the agent's the process that runs on um, each VM and connects back to coder. You, this is how it's authenticating. It's just using AWS instance identity. So that means that basically each instance has a unique ID and then um, coders getting that instance ID from the agent and saying, oh yeah, that looks just like the one we provisioned with Terraform, we trust it. Um, there's, there's other ways to authenticate though, such as just a token, which then you send into the agent and that agent uses that token to prove that um, it's actually the, the thing that was provisioned. Um, Every part of the, the workspace is pretty much customizable. So if I actually go into my, my virtual machine one here, um, whoops, this is one that I have stopped. Here's my new one. The CPU, disk, and memory, these are also things that are configurable in the template. So the CPU usage is actually just coming from top. Um, the, the memory usage is coming from free. And we provide all of these, these examples, but you could also show anything here. You could show a code of the day. You could show GPU usage if you had a GPU attached. You could show what processes are running, um, anything like that. These, these icons here too, code server, this is a um, defined in a template. So here it's saying on the workspace, there's something running on um, this port. So when you click into it, just proxy what's happening in that port into coder. So this is why you don't need to open any um, ingress rules for the workspace itself, because this is all being proxied through the coder control plane. So the, the user's authentication is giving them access to this. So if I was to open an, an incognito tab, for example, and try to access the, the IDE, um, let's see if I can do that real quick. Um, this is a new machine for me, so we'll just, we'll just skip that. But you can imagine that a developer wouldn't be able to access this URL unless they're um, authenticated into coder and have access to that workspace. Uh, so let me go ahead and close that. Scrolling down a bit, this is the user data that we use to stop and start the workspace. Um, I would explain this, but we actually have a more sophisticated way of doing this in an upcoming release in Coder, so I'm just gonna skip that for now. And here's where the, the AWS instance is actually being provisioned. Uh, it's, it's quite simple. Um, the, this is using the AWS Terraform provider, and the AWS Terraform provider has a lot of different options. So if you wanted to run it in a specific VPC, you could. If you, could run it, if you wanted to run on a specific security group or add more tags to the instance, all those things you can totally do. You can either hard code them or reference the coder parameter, which is um, an option the developer is able to, to pick from. So in our example, it's quite simple, but we don't need to build new coder features when you need to modify the AWS instance. You can all just do it in Terraform. And, and then finally, we have something called coder metadata, which shows this information right here, region, instance type, disk. And I wanted to share, or do a demo of a quick like update to a template. So I think adding new coder metadata is a, is a pretty simple one to do. So I'm gonna add a new item here. I'm just gonna name it, um, I'm not feeling super creative. Let's see, I'll name it fun. This is some fun metadata. It's not really fun, but I couldn't think of anything fun. Uh, from here, I can create a new version of this template and developers will be prompted to update. So let me show you how that works. This is running off um, a Terraform build again. Again, it's not happening on my local computer, it's happening on the, the coder server. So the, the coder server has all the permissions it needs to authenticate with the AWS. And um, as I was mentioning in my um, previous video, developers aren't necessarily expected to edit these templates, or if they are, they're doing it in the form of pull requests. They're not just directly publishing this because when I publish a new template version, it's essentially, it'll be available to all developers. And um, 
they'll have a change. So developers are expected to customize their workspaces with parameters. Um, they can bring their own dot files if they have specific um, kind of shells and tools they prefer to use, or they can just install tools into their workspace if they have a persistent template like a virtual machine. Um, so any change that I'm making this template is one that I expect all users of this template to kind of benefit from, or I'm adding a new parameter, which then some users can kind of opt in and use. So when I'm creating a new version, I can give it a little message. I will say um, added fun metadata. I'll publish this. And um, immediately on this side of Coder, there is a little note that's saying my workspace is outdated and um, it's added fun metadata into the latest version. So when I hit update here, or there's a big update button here, um, this will go ahead and stop my workspace and restart it. And when I have it, it'll have the, the fun metadata in it. Um, we have an upcoming feature that will also automatically update workspaces on a specific like time period. So maybe at midnight, every workspace, if it's still running, will be stopped and um, updated. Or um, if the workspace is stopped, the next morning when the developer starts it, or it automatically starts, we have a feature that automatically starts workspaces, um, it will be um, spun up. So while I'm kind of waiting for this, I wanted to share one thing about like resource persistence. Um, I'm going to make this full screen so it's a little bit easier to read. And I'm going to search for start count. Oh, here we go. Now, in, in this example, the way I'm starting and, and stopping the workspace is with user data. Um, like I said, we have a more sophisticated way of doing this in another code release, but what I'm essentially doing here is I'm checking to see if the workspace is in a start transition during the build. So this is like during the, the Terraform apply. And if so, I'm passing in the, the user data that starts up the agent. If it's not in a start, um, which is, is, is a conditional, it'll run the, the end, which will run shut down and turn off the workspace. So this allows you as the coder admin to control what resources are um, there during a start and a stop. The way this works in our Kubernetes example is we have a two resources that are two kind of important resources, the Kubernetes pod and the persistent volume claim. When a workspace is stopped, what we do is we use the count attribute in Terraform to destroy the um, Kubernetes pod. We set the count to zero but it'll keep that disk so that the user's source code and dot files and everything is saved, but that pod is um, destroyed, freeing up the cluster. And um, I've just updated my workspace. Here's my fun metadata right here. And um, I, as I mentioned in the last video too, the, the start and stop, it's used both to save on cloud costs and to help developers get onto the latest version. So when you restart the workspace, it does a start and stop. And um, here I am with my new version of my template and my new metadata that shows up in the workspaces page.